right. I, I think I mentioned to you, let's open our Bibles, if not Matthew, uh, rather Mark chapter 16. We're going to be looking at verses 12 and 13, and uh, I'll be sharing also out of uh, Luke, because Luke chapter 24 gives us more of a full detailed account of what we're looking at here in, uh, in the uh, gospel of Mark. And so I'll read to you out of Mark chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. I'll share a few things. I'm going to give you an introduction, and then we'll pick up our study. And so beginning at verse 12, Mark 16, verses 12 and 13, Mark writes, after that he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Now, what I'm planning to do, and I'll share this with you up front here at the beginning of our study, is we're almost at the conclusion of the Gospel of Mark. We're here in chapter 16, and obviously it wouldn't take an awful lot of time for us to pick up the verses and to go through it, and I could conclude this in really a one more study, but we're not going to do that, and I'll tell you why. It's because I want to give you a more thorough account of the things that took place after Jesus had been resurrected. So I'm going to share with you excerpts from the other uh, portions of Scripture. So that way you get a more full account. And I'm actually going to conclude our study of Mark by uh, looking at a couple of chapters in the beginning of the book of Acts. So that's what I'm going to be doing. And so I'm taking my time because I want to lay as much information on you as I can. And it requires me to not only look at these two verses, but to take you to Luke, which we'll do. And then we're going to be looking in John and and other portions as we move to conclude our study here in the Gospel of Mark. And so it's probably going to take us another four to five weeks at least until I'm finally satisfied that I gave you enough information concerning the things that are transpiring here in the last, last chapter and last verses. So with that said, um, we'll begin with a brief recap just to bring you up to speed. And all these are things you're familiar with. We've, all, we've already looked through and these, uh, some of these things perhaps I haven't shared with you yet in much detail. So we're going to begin with a recap. Now I mentioned to you that many think that uh, Jesus resurrected and was immediately taken into heaven, immediately ascended. But the fact is that he actually uh, remained on earth for over a month after his resurrection and he continued his ministry. You see, after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to people on several occasions for example, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene in John 20. He then appeared to Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, Matthew 28. He appeared to the apostle Peter in Luke 24. He appeared to the 10 in the upper room. He appeared to the 11 a week later. He appeared to seven of the apostles at the Sea of Galilee. He appeared to the 11 on a mountain in Galilee. He went on to appear before 500 eyewitnesses. That's recorded in 1 Corinthians 15. He appeared to James, most likely the brother of the Lord Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15, and he also appeared at his ascension on the Mount of Olives. So there were a number of times that Jesus actually was seen by people. Sometimes we think that he was resurrected and just immediately ascended, but he stayed and remained for some time. His ministry didn't stop when he died and was resurrected. He continued his teaching ministry to his disciples because they had many questions. And Luke says that in Acts chapter 1 verse 3 where it says, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So there was a lot of confusion as you could imagine that needed to be cleared up amongst his followers. There was also unfinished business that he had with his apostles, especially the apostle Peter. And all of that's going to take some time. So Jesus remains, and he ministered for 40 days, for over a month. And when he finished his ministry on earth, he then ascended into heaven. Acts 1 verse 9 says, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And so Mark's gospel does not include all of his appearances after the, the resurrection. 
And so when you look at it, and as we have, notice verse 9 here in chapter 16, how it says, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. And so, Jesus first appears to her. Now, John told us that, that uh, Mary had gone to the tomb, and, and she saw that the stone had been rolled away. And she went to tell Simon Peter, as well as uh, the apostle John, and, and they ran to the tomb. We looked at that, how John arrived at the tomb before Peter, and at first, John stooped, he looked in, he saw the linen cloth, but he stayed outside. Peter arrived and went into the tomb, and he saw the same thing that John had seen. You see, John had looked in, he had believed, but Peter left marveling at what had happened. And when they left, Mary stood at the tomb weeping, and that's when Jesus appeared to her. She was confused at first, as we've seen, she thought he was... Uh, the gardener that uh, worked for Joseph of Arimathea. I mentioned to you that it was early. It was uh, a, a time where she was in emotional distress. She was confused and blinded by her tears. It's understandable that she didn't recognize him. But I also mentioned that there was even a greater reason she didn't recognize him. She came in a state of unbelief. She didn't expect to see him alive. She had come to the tomb with expectation. She was expecting to find a dead body. We saw that, how that the angels had spoken to her and asked her, why are you weeping? And she said, they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. And it was at that time that, that Jesus spoke to her and he first asked her, he said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And in tears she had answered. She said, sir, if you've taken him away, tell me where you have laid him. I will take him away. And now instead of calling her woman, Jesus called her by her name. And you can almost hear the tenderness in his voice as he spoke to her. He said, Mary. And she recognized the voice of her shepherd. And she said, Ravoni, which is my dear master. Upon hearing her voice, his voice rather, her, her fear and her pain disappeared. And, and John records how she, she clung to him tightly. She was afraid of losing him again. And he told her to release him because he still had work to do. But she also had work that she was to do because he, he told her, go to my brethren, tell them what you have seen. You have marching orders. You're to go and you're to talk. First service, I shared some things that aren't in my notes, and I said to them in a teasing way, I probably won't share that in the second service, but here we go. If there's anything, and let me first, some of you, some of you don't, don't know who I am at all, and that's okay. You're really missing out on a lot. No, uh, I'm teasing. But, you know, as a Christian, I've been a Christian for 52 years. I've been pastoring this church for almost 42 years. I've been teaching the Word of God for 49 years. So I'm just saying that so that you know. Yeah, thank you so much. How much did John pay you to clap? I, I do appreciate that. I, I'm encouraged by that. And so let me say that first and foremost, because some of you, you know, you look and just say, Ooh, who's that guy? Well, I'm, I'm a pastor. I've been ministering for a long time taught the Word of God since September of 1973. So I've been, I've been in the Word for a long time, and, 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 and I, I usually restrain some of the things that I have to say because I want to make sure that I'm, I'm giving to you what the passage says, and that's what teachers are supposed to do. But as I was looking at this passage this morning, refreshing my mind just before I came out for first service, I, I, I thought about what Jesus had, had done he had said, go and tell my brethren. And so I was beginning to think about that in the uh, first service, and I shared some things because I believe that, if, uh, that the church, that we, the body of Christ, we who are believers in Jesus, we who love him, we who believe that he died, was buried, that he rose the third day, that he ascended to heaven, we who believe that he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell within the church and that he gave us a commission to go out and to preach the gospel to every creature, we, we believe that. And the heart of, of Christianity has always been to be faithful witnesses. 
to go out to share, to tell people this is the truth, this is what God has said. And, and we're living in a time, I think, that because there is so much negative backlash that there are some who are getting a little bit um, gun-shy, if you will. Uh, there are words that are being forbidden. You can't use this word, you can't use that word, and all. And people are being brainwashed every day by nonsense. And so I was sharing some things from my heart. I'm going to share with you a little bit of that today as we go into it. Because I was looking at how Jesus said, go and tell. Now, he said, go tell my brethren, but he said, go and tell. Be a witness. Be a witness of what I've done. Tell them that, that, that you spoke to me. Tell them that, that Jesus is saying that, that I, I, I rose from the... Tell them. Don't keep it to yourself, even if they don't believe you. We're being told as, as people of God to shut up. We are. We know that. We're being told, shut up. You can have your religion. Keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. Well, every day the world progresses in taking the minds of our children, taking the minds of people, while the church is afraid of just speaking the truth in love. And so we're living in a moment that I think is a very important moment, and that is we are being told that we can choose to be what we are, that there are 100, 200, 300, whatever, different ways or variables, and that's not just a man and a woman, but, you, you know, that men can get pregnant, and, and uh, it's, it's just kind of like, well, it's delusional. It's what it is. It's demonic, for sure. At the heart of that is, is demonic. It's, that's just what it is. It's undermining the teaching of the Word of God, where he created Adam and Eve, and they had a uh, commission and all of that that we're familiar with as Bible readers, but that's what's taking place right now. And, and, the, and one of the fastest rising movements is to try and convince uh, Americans, and they're doing a very good job of it, that, uh, that you choose your gender. And uh, that's it's greatly dis, di, uh, di, distressing. And we need to be those who speak and share the truth with people. You know, years ago, uh, when there was big controversy going on, I, I had stood behind this, this platform here, on this platform, behind the pulpit like this, and I had said, I said this, I said, you know, I can tell you that I'm a six-foot-five-inch, blonde, blue-eyed Swede. They're good. You can laugh. Thank you. <laughs> because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be looking at me saying, you're crazy or there's something wrong with you, where'd you get that idea, right? But now I legally can do that, and you have to believe me. You have to believe me. How dare you be such a bigot? How dare you? And that's, you've been brainwashed. You've been told that. I don't think you have, but the world has, and maybe some have. I don't know and whether you believe that or not. But I've said that, and I was making a point, and it was in jest, but now that's real. So we have some kid. Now, I don't drink. I haven't had a beer or anything for as long as I can remember. Don't remember the taste of it, but I'll tell you this. We have some guy who is celebrating, he says, his first year of womanhood. Every, and he's a guy, and he's on some, some beer can, you know, that you can... <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> that's what you can do with the cans, not him. And, and then, then the CEO of, of the particular brewery organization writes his, uh, or her, his, I believe, his statement related to it, and, uh, and everybody's supposed to still go by his brew and this and that. And I, I just think it's crazy. I think it is. It's delusional. And I think the church has to, has to say, no, you're not going to tell my kids that a, a woman, um, you know, is, is anything other than a woman. God created Adam, he created Eve, and that's what it is. And so, when, when you have, when, uh, yeah, here we go, so w when you have a man competing in races, swimming races, or, or fighting in MMA, beating up and almost hospitalizing women, what happened to the way we think? What happened where you think some man, six foot plus, 
is a, is a woman swimmer, and he hasn't had any transitions done at all. And, and there he is undressing in front of women in locker room. Or we're, we're being told that you have to have uh, bathrooms that men and w women can use. With it, we're, we're talking about crazy. We're living in crazy land. And, and when you have a Supreme Court justice who cannot define what a woman, you're living in crazy land. That's a fact. Now, I'm not mocking people who have delusions. I'm not. The, the, the enemy has blinded the eyes, and they cannot see. I'm not angry at them, but I'm certainly not going to be quiet about it either. We have to speak up. There's something wrong here. We have to. We have to. Oh, you're going to hurt the feelings. Guess what? I'm an old man. I've had my feelings hurt a lot over the years. A lot. After church, a lot of times. So I just hit them. No, after <laughs> church. It's just a fact. We live in a world. We cannot be living in some kind of bubble where we're afraid to offend. Guess what? I love you enough to tell you the truth. I don't, have, I don't think anybody here is going to have a problem with that. Maybe so. Let me say it. I'm telling you the truth. Listen. A man and a woman, God created so that they could populate. God calls marriage a holy thing because he intends us to take his faith, imparting it to our children. So it's a holy, sacred relationship created by God himself. So some man says, I'm going to celebrate. Some man says, I'm going to celebrate 365 days of being a woman, and they put them on a beer can. I wonder why women aren't insulted by that. Are you? I, no, we can't say anything. My goodness, no, we'll hurt his feelings. So they've lost like $5 billion in sales, and that's good. Can't do it. You can't, for, you can't force me to do that. You can't do that. Listen. If you have a man and a woman, and you were to place them on an island that they could live off of the produce that is naturally there, you leave them and you abandon them on a good size island. And a hundred years later, people find that island, they're going to find a lot, of, a lot of people. It's going to be populated over a hundred years. You're going to find a lot of people there. That's what's going to happen because a man and a woman uh, uh, of uh, the age where they can. Uh, reproduce, that's what you're going to find. But if you put a man and a, chan, a transgender, a man who thinks he's a woman, you put two, those people on the same island, in a hundred years you come back, you're going to find skeletons of two men. <laughs> that's what you're going to find. That's what you're going to find. Why don't we realize that? When a woman decides to take hormones and grow a beard, that doesn't make her a man. I had a nun that had a better mustache than I had. <laughs> it's a fact. That was at Our Lady of Perpetual Motion when I used to go to... <laughs> Am I angry? No. Of course not. But what is it, what is it that the Lord said? Go and tell them. What are we doing? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, listen, they're going after our children. They're going after our grandchildren. That's a fact. When you have a man with a beard wearing a dress in a, in a you know, entertaining children and doing nasty dancing, and mothers are bringing their one- and two-year-old children to watch this, God help us. The nations of the world are looking at the United States and they're mocking us because we have, we had, and I'll stop, but one more thing, because it's worth saying, we had three, I call them babies, they were nine years old, three nine-year-old babies who went to Christian school just to go to school. Mama, daddy dropped them off and ended up with three dead babies because 
some woman who thinks she's a man decided to take out whatever she had, her anger on them, left a manifesto. She told everybody why she did it, and the press will not publish it. Why is that? Why is that? It's a manifesto. It's out. Why is it that? Listen, if it was a Christian who did that, you better believe that manifesto would have been printed, and they'd be pointing fingers at Christians. Look at what you do. Look at how you are. They would be doing that. That's a fact. You know that, and I do too. If it was Republicans, and I, you know, Republican, Independent, Democrat, you know, I'm not making a case for either, but I'm telling you what we're seeing right now, and you see it too. And three, three people in their 60s who were there caring for the kids, loving the children, they got killed too. And what are they saying? There were six deaths at this Christian school, and they're saying, there were seven deaths. Don't for, now, wait a minute. Since when did we celebrate the person who kills children? When did we? Well, we started celebrating them when we said abortion is okay. That's when we started. I told this church, and many of you weren't here, but I told this church when uh, many years ago when there was a, uh, a mass shooting, I said to the, the church, and it was at a school, and I had said, you would think that a classroom is the safest place for a child, wouldn't you? And, and our church at that time said, yes, in Columbine, in Columbine when that happened, and my church nodded their head, and he said, yes. I said, you would think that a classroom would be the safest place for a child, wouldn't you? And my church all just, we, we, yes, yes, I said, that's where you're wrong. The safest place for a child is in the womb, and when you take the life of a child in the womb, you will take a life of the child in the classroom. We have stopped valuing life. Wake up. They're killing our children, and they think it's okay. And it's not. And it's not. And so this is what we're living in. So, yeah, that's not in the passage. They said, will you get back to the passage? Yeah, I will. But go and tell. Open your mouths. Be free to speak. They have been lying to you. Tell them the truth. Don't just be there at the, at the water cooler at work where they're saying, well, I believe in all this and those Christians and you're just slip, sipping your water and you walk back. Don't do that. Stand up. Tell them. You have every right to tell them the truth. Every right. So tell them. You know? I, I, when I got saved, nobody told me I couldn't talk. As far as I know, I have First Amendment rights. And, and I didn't give them up when I got saved. I ex exercise them because I have freedom of speech and freedom of the practice of religion. I have that freedom, and so do you. And we as a church need to be aware of that. Am I saying be pugnacious? No. Am I saying start fights? No, of course not. Just be willing to talk. Just be willing to say, with all due respect, I don't agree with that. And let me tell you why. And the way you'll be able to do that, we'll see this in a minute, I'm getting ahead of my notes, is by knowing the word. By knowing the word. And so let's get back to the Bible study. That was an aside that I felt necessary to share. And I know I offended people. People walk out and that's okay if they want to. But may the spirit of the Lord convict them. Go and tell my brethren. Tell them what you've seen. And in John 20, 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples what she had seen, that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. So she became the first to see the risen Lord and to testify of his resurrection. The woman who was delivered of seven devils was the first to declare his victory. It says in verse 10 here in chapter 16, she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. It was too good to be true. So they refused to listen to what was said. You see, to them, in the midst of their grief, this all seemed like nonsense. But that's what's taking place. And so in verse 12, it says, and that was your intro, after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. And so this particular uh, portion, these two verses, actually we have more information. I'm going to ask you now to turn 
to Luke chapter uh, 24, and I want to show you some things there and build this for you. Luke chapter 24. The details are found in Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 13 all the way to verse 35. But let me read to you, beginning in Luke chapter 24 at verse 13. In Luke 24, verse 13, it says, Behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and, and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. He said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God, and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And, and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and, and found it just as the women said, but him they did not see. So Luke begins to give us more information of this conversation between Jesus and two who are traveling. And these two, as it says, are traveling to a village called Emmaus. And it's told, we're told that Emmaus was close to Jerusalem, around seven miles away. In verse 14, they were talking together of all the things that had happened. They're, as they're walking, they're talking about the recent events. And so as they're conversing, verse 15, and reasoning, Jesus draws near them. So it says they were conversing and reasoning. They were, they were talking about the possibility of Jesus being Messiah. When it says reasoned, when they were reasoning, that word reason means to dispute or to investigate together. It speaks of discussing in a deep way. That's what they were doing. They were speaking. One would say something. The other would respond to it. So they were reasoning with one another about what had happened. So as this is taking place, Jesus himself drew near and he went with them. They didn't have the information uh, at that time that they, they needed to be able to understand what had happened. And so while they're disputing and asking questions, <laughs> the answer to their questions came and joined himself to them. Jesus joins their conversation, and they don't even realize it. Now, why would Jesus speak to two? Why, why do we see that he's speaking to, to two? Why did Luke include that? It's because uh, according to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, and, and 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, it's the witness of two that everything is established. So he's speaking to two in order that there would be uh, a perf uh, there's a, a complete witness there, two people, not just a single person. But as he's speaking to them, they don't recognize him. Well, how'd that happen? Well, we saw in, in Mark 16, verse 12, it, it, he had said, after that, he appeared in another form to two of them. So he appeared in another form. The word appear simply means to be visibly manifested. It means to be made known or to see. Another form uh, is two Greek words that, that it, 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 heterosmorphe is what the Greek is, heterosmorphe. And, and it speaks of a, a different external appearance. And so he visibly manifests himself in a different physical appearance. That's what's taking place. Now, I'm going to do a bit of a theological aside for a moment because it's necessary at this point. Some, some teach to this day that Jesus assumed different physical looks. In other words, he changed the way he looked. Some believe that, and they say that, that he changed the way he looked physically after his resurrection, and they teach that Jesus took upon himself different physical 
uh, appearances, different shapes, the shapes that he desired at that time. This is because they say that Jesus' resurrection was not physical. They say that his resurrection was spiritual, and therefore they say in that he was spiritually resurrected, he could manifest himself or ex express himself uh, looking in a different way. And so this is actually one of the passages that they look to to uh, point to that, that belief. They, they want to present that he looked different. Well, in John 20, verse 15, they will say that Jesus assumed, he took upon himself the appearance of a gardener. And then they say here that he, he looked different and they combined these. Let me give you the answer to that because some of you perhaps have had people tell you that. One, Jesus was bodily resurrected and not spiritually resurrected. One of my, I, I took a master's class in Azusa Pacific many years ago, and professor was asking whether or not it matters whether Jesus was physically or spiritually uh, resurrected. The professor was saying that it apparently didn't matter, but it does matter. It does matter because the Bible teaches that he was physically resurrected, and and you see, when Jesus appears, and we're going to look at this uh, as we continue on next week, more than likely, or soon after. When Jesus appears to his men, um, and, and they're frightened, well, Thomas was not present when that happened the first time, and so they had told Thomas that Jesus was there, and he said, unless I put my hand into his wounds, uh, there's no way I'm going to believe. And then later on, in John 20, um, later on, Jesus entered into the room, and he told Thomas, he said, put, your, put your, your, your finger into my wounds and see that it is me. That was the whole point he was making. There was a physical resurrection, and he even showed him the wounds. That's when Thomas said, my Lord and my God. That's when Thomas said that. And so Jesus was not spiritually resurrected. He wasn't a spirit being. He was physically resurrected. So, some will say, but wait a minute, he looked like a gardener. No, remember what the word actually says. The word actually says that Mary, supposing him to be the gardener, said, if, they, if you've taken away my Lord, tell me where he is and I'll go get him. She supposed him. Uh, again, she was blinded by tears. It was dark. Uh, she was in grief. She didn't expect to see him. And, and so she was confused. And that's why Jesus spoke to her and ministered to him to her rather, because she mistook him for the gardener who worked for Joseph of Arimathea. Well, in this particular portion of Scripture, Luke clearly says that their eyes were restrained. That's what he's saying here. Their eyes were restrained. Verse 16, that they did not know him. Their eyes were restrained. They were held in check. So to them, he looked different from his usual appearance. They weren't expecting to see him. After all, he's dead. So Jesus seems to have restrained them from recognizing him. And the fact is, we can't see him. We can't see him for who he is unless he discloses himself to us. In Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Jesus held their eyes in check. He was ministering to them, and we're going to see that that ministry as we go on. Notice verse 17 again. He says, what kind of conversation is this that you, you, you have with, with one another as you walk? And, and he points out, and are sad. So he's walking along with them. They're con conversing, and he's quiet. But at the proper moment, he interrupts them, and he does so with a question. And that, well, that seems a bit personal because they're having a, a private conversation when this stranger attaches himself and yet, in spite of this, he breaks in and even asks him a question. And, and uh, he's the one who can answer the question. You ought to ask him. Well, verse 18 says, one whose name was Clopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have, and have you not known the things which happened there in, in these days? That was not a polite response. They were grieving. He interrupted their private conversation. But Jesus continues, verse 19, 
He said, oh, what things? So they begin to explain. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. So he wants them to, to tell him, what's on your mind? By letting them talk, he's going to clear things up for them. So they begin to outline who Jesus was, what had happened. They, they speak of Jesus of Nazareth. They speak the, of him being a, a miracle-working prophet. He was an amazing teacher. Now, when, when they speak to him and, and, uh, in verse 19, and they say, who was a prophet, you need to understand that they were not simply saying that he was a prophet like, like uh, uh, Jeremiah or one of the others, you know, Isaiah, but that he was, we thought he was the prophet. Now, the prophet is Messiah. The prophet is actually a phrase that was used and still used to describe Messiah. So we thought he was the prophet is what they're saying. You see, in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 18, um, Moses said, I will raise up, uh, God actually through Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So they knew the, of this prophet who was to come, who was a prophet like unto Moses. And so when they're speaking in that way, they're saying, we thought that Jesus of Nazareth, a miracle worker, was, was the prophet. And so they're speaking about our disappointment that we have. We were hoping that he was going to redeem us, verse 21. We thought he'd deliver us. We thought he was the redeemer, but he was killed. So as, as far as they're concerned, Jesus is still dead. He's still in the tomb. This had happened only three days before. But they continue on, verse 22. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that he had, he had, uh, they had also seen a vision of angels who, who said he was alive. And certain of those who were, were with us went to the tomb and and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Some women went to the tomb. They didn't find his body. It was empty. Instead of finding his body, they saw angels. And, and then, and then they, they said that some of the women went to the tomb, and they found the tomb was empty. They were saying they couldn't find his body, that he's alive. Others have gone to the tomb. They didn't see Jesus. The problem there's no visible proof that any of this happened. So what you have here is an internal war. It's being waged between hope and disappointment. They can't believe that this happened without proof. And so they weren't putting their trust in the promise of the Lord to rise from the dead. These were his disciples. These were not strangers to him. They were not the 12. They could have been part of the 70, but they most certainly were followers of Christ. And so... The teachings of Christ, undoubtedly, over the three years or so of his ministry, they had heard these kinds of things. These were things that were being spoken. And so we're disappointed because he asked them, why are you so sad? What is it that you're talking about? Why are you so sad? Well, verse 25, he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What an incredible Bible study that would have been. Starting with Moses, the first prophecy of Messiah is Genesis 3.15, where God is speaking of, of the, um, what will happen between Satan and, and Jesus, ultimately. Uh, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. Beginning in Moses and in entering into the prophets, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. Psalm 49, 15, God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. 
And so he gives this incredible Bible study to them. Would you like a Bible study like that? You can have it. Read your Bible. It's there. <laughs> well, as this is taking place, verse 28, they drew near to the village where they were, go they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now, it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it and, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? And they rose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed, has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Well, they were going to Emmaus and Jesus made as if he was going to continue and they said, no, please, stay with us. He wouldn't have remained with them without the invitation. You see, if, if they had no interest, he would have continued on down the road. There's this hunger that we should have for spiritual things that should motivate us to invite Christ to dine with us, if you will. Jeremiah 15, 16 says it like this, your words were found, I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I'm called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Your words were found and I ate them. Job said his word was more important than his daily food. I desire your word. And please, Share more with me. So they constrained him. Abide with us. It's, it's, it's getting late. There, are, there are, are wild animals on the road. There, there are, are people who can do you harm on the road. Stay with us. It's, it's getting, getting late. So they asked, would you abide with us? What a blessing they would have missed if they had not asked him to stay. The amount of time that you spend with the Lord is a good indicator of your actual hunger for him. The psalmist in Psalm 63, verse 1, said it like this. He said, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I seek you early. I desire you. You fill me. You quench my thirst. And so Jesus speaks to them, and I think this is beautiful. It says their eyes were open, and they knew him after he had broken bread. That breaking of the bread could very well have been a reminder of how he had fed the multitude. Just the fact that he broke the bread and, and served them would remind them of the ministry that he has already performed and, and their eyes were open. They knew him. It says in verse 31, he vanished. And, and I looked that up. I wanted, you know, vanished? That's a strong word. And so some of the commentators will say that when they were eating and looking down, he walked out of the room. Nah, that's nonsense. That's not what the word means. The word vanished simply means disappeared. He disappeared. That would be trippy, wouldn't it? But he disappeared. And as that happened, they begin to speak. And verse 32 is so powerful when, when they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Uh, back when I first got saved, we called this holy heartburn. <laughs> That's what this was, holy heartburn. He showed them in all the scriptures the things that concerned himself. Why is that? Because scripture points to Jesus. It's summed up and fulfilled in him. Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And as he taught them, their eyes were opened and they knew him because that comes to the word of God. Open means to, the word open there speaks of opening the mind. It means to cause someone to understand something. His teaching opened their eyes, causing them to understand the plan of God. Again, the way to know him is by his word and him opening our eyes. And if God doesn't open our eyes, we, we remain blind to who Jesus is and, and we walk in spiritual darkness. People will come, you know, I was, I was hearing someone speak the other day and he was sharing how, he said, yeah, I went to church before I got saved. I went to church on, 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 on Easter and on Christmas. And there's a lot of, of people who would say, yeah, that's what I do. I go once or twice a, a, a year 
you know, for special Christian holidays. And when you speak to them and you ask them, as you could have done the same with me, and you would ask them, are you a Christian? I, I, would, I answered, yes, yes, I am. I answered that. Yes, I am. I'm a Christian. What else would it be? I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not, I'm not a, a Hindu. I'm not, I'm not Muslim. Uh, you know, I went through certain stages and, and various things to become a Christian. So if you ask me, I would say that. So for me, I was very comfortable going to church because Christians go to church, but I wasn't saved, right? Many of us in this room could say the same thing. Your eyes have to be opened by God. In 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. One of the ways to know whether you're saved is whether you like the Bible, whether you read the Bible, whether you study the Bible, whether that is something that's necessary to you. Because in, in, in many churches, in the case of many people, with no condemnation at all towards those that I'm mentioning, but in many churches, the only time the Bible's ever opened for some Christians attending that church is when it's opened in the church. It's the only time. It's, it's a number one selling book in the United States still to this day, but it's the most unread. And so when the Holy Spirit is working, you will get this sense of, aha, if you will, my eyes are being open. I, now I see that. I'll say this quickly, but before I became a Christian, I was a hippie, and being a hippie just simply means that you're open-minded. And one day I thought, man, I'm open-minded which simply means that any trash can be dropped into my head. I'm like a waste basket. The world can just drop thoughts into my head because I'm open and I learned to be discerning when I got saved. If the word of God says it, I want to do it. If it doesn't say it, then I don't want to believe it. It's that simple. Because I have a book. There are people who say, I feel sorry for you because you have that one book. Well, and you trust in one man. Well, who do you trust in? Who do you trust in? Trust in yourself. Have you ever been wrong? Yeah, then you're not trustworthy. Why would I trust in you? I trust in Jesus Christ, who's never wrong. He knew no sin. I trust in the word of God. It's right. So man's opinion doesn't matter to me. What does it say? And it's very simple. It's very simple. And so what happens? Well, he opens up the scriptures to them, and, and their heart is stirred with the spiritual fire. And so verse 33 tells us, they rose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem as a seven seven mile walk found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying the lord is risen indeed he's appeared to simon and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread well it was still dark it was difficult to walk in those unlit paths and and yes there's still the danger of of, of animals or thieves but they forgot their own concerns <laughs> And they hurried out of that room so they could go to Jerusalem and speak. And then finally, Mark 16, 13 simply says, they went and told it to the rest, but they didn't believe them either. And that's the initial response of the apostles. We just don't believe it. We've heard this, it's already been told to us, and we don't believe it. The next study we have, we're going to be looking at how the Lord responds to unbelief in his followers. Father, we ask.